Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Genesis chapter 46. Genesis chapter 46. John Adams is one of our revered and respected fathers of our nature, nation. His greatest biographer, David McCullough, has written us the story of this sacrificial and saintly man. And much of what I'm going to say about John Adams is taken from a talk that McCullough gave at Hillsdale College and it was reprinted in Imprimis magazine. John Adams was born a poor farm boy. He entered Harvard at 15. He set himself to read forever. He was a deeply devoted Christian. The correspondence between he and his beloved wife, Abigail, are some of the most amazing letters ever written. He served our country well. He sacrificed often for its advancement. He argued for the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. He chose Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. He appointed Washington as head of the army, and he appointed John Marshall as Chief Justice. As he retired from public service, he met with heartache and hardship. He suffered terribly with physical ailments. His wife and daughter both died in the same season of the year. He was abandoned, he was forgotten, and even vilified. And I want you to give you, I want to give you a letter that the feel of his fiber, McCullough wrote, one of the few things that Adams had left that he adored in his last years were his fruit trees. But then came one March night, a terrible ice storm. And he woke up the next morning to see all of his trees shattered. This could have broken him. But it didn't. Listen to what he wrote. A rain had fallen from some warmer region in the skies. When the cold here below was intense to an extreme, every drop was frozen wherever it fell in the trees and clung to the limbs and sprigs as if it had been fastened by hooks of steel. The earth was never more universally covered with snow, and the rain had frozen upon a crust on the surface which shone with the brightness of burnished silver. The icicles on every sprig glowed in all the luster of diamonds. Every tree was a chandelier of cut glass. I've seen a queen of France with 18 million livres of diamonds upon her person, and I declare that all the charms of her face and figure added to all the glitter of her jewels did not make an impression on me equal to that presented by every shrub. The whole world was glittering with precious stones, and his orchard was totally destroyed. Adams died, as many of you know, the same day that Thomas Jefferson died. Jefferson had been his closest friend, then political rival, and then a bitter political enemy. After 12 years of neither speaking to each other, Adams initiated the first letter of what was to be one of the great reconciliations in all of history. The correspondence between these two former presidents lasted until death and is some of the most wonderful letters in the English language. They are available if you ever want to read them. And then they died on the same day, each in his own bed, surrounded by his books. And it wasn't just any day. It was the 4th of July, exactly 50 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. The movement of God's purpose has been constantly forward, even through tremendous obstacles. We've seen that all through the book of Genesis. 
It was true in the life of John Adams. We have seen it week after week in our studies. And just when it seems hopeless, God moves with his power to fulfill his promises and to accomplish his purposes. And so now at this moment, God's people have left the promised land in the midst of a terrible famine and have seemed to be settling into Egypt. And we ask ourselves, how is this a good thing? Abraham had come back to Egypt during famine <clears throat> with disastrous consequence to his reputation. His son, Isaac, following his dad's example, did the same thing. Yet in Egypt, <clears throat> God had chosen to enrich and to prosper them both. And this is the constant dilemma of God's people living in exile, away from our homeland in heaven. Obstacle after obstacle seems to arise. Just when we seem to be making a great advance, some setback brings us up short. This besets our personal lives and our lives together as God's people. I know that we had hoped for a season of growth and advancement, and we are plunged into the difficulties of a pandemic. I know that some of you experienced financial and health reversals when you had hoped for further progress and growth. And how are we going to respond to all of this? Will we have an attitude like John Adams that will see in all the devastation, the sparkling diamonds of God's good, but oh, so hard providences? Do we become fatalists? I just shrugging our spiritual shoulders at whatever comes to pass. Is there a way to be submissive to God's providence as well as still engaged in the world around us with wisdom and confidence and deft spiritual balance? I believe so. And I believe this is precisely the question, the dilemma Moses is dealing with here for the sake of all who will hear those to whom it was written, and for all who were here today. We begin in chapter 46 and verse 28 with the preparation for a pagan land. Joseph has lived in Egypt for probably up to 13 years, a long time. He knows their customs. He knows their biases as well. And so, he has to prepare his family to do well in the land of their sojourn. This is what God has done for us as well. Through the word of God, he has prepared us and is continuing to prepare us to do well here, now, in the land of our sojourn. Joseph begins in the reunion with his father in verses 28 through 30. Moses writes, He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph, that is, Jacob had, to show the way before him to Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. And Jacob had sent Judah to connect with Joseph. Together they would show the way into and make sure that all was okay in the land of Goshen where the Israelites would settle. Judah led the way and Joseph joined them after. What a moment for father and son, so many years of suffering, so many years of hardship, and so many years of unexpected advances, so many years of grief and sorrow. I'm now in a foreign land, in a place set aside for them. This aged father meets once again his much-loved son. 
And Israel is content now. Grief has been turned to gladness. Hopelessness has been reversed with joy revived. Now Jacob, old and frail, is ready to die. He knows his son is alive and all is well. All is well. But there is also Joseph prepares for their living in a pagan land in the instruction to his family, verses 31 through 34. And here is some little hard but very careful instruction to his family. Listen to what he said, verse 31. Joseph said to his brother and to his father's house, that I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan, they have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all they have. And when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now, the first thing is that Joseph tells them what he's going to say to Pharaoh. Joseph is open and honest with the Pharaoh. This is treating the Pharaoh with respect, and he expects the Pharaoh will respond very well, even though there is a terrible prejudice against shepherds. You see, the Egyptians were cattle people. They hated sheep. They particularly hated goats. They despised shepherds as dirty and an abomination. It seems that Joseph was banking on the respect that he had earned with the Pharaoh to overcome the Pharaoh's bias against the shepherds. And then Joseph tells his family how they must identify their vocation. Because of the Egyptian view of shepherds, the Israelites in Goshen, when talking with Egyptian from other parts of Egypt, should be careful how they speak of their livelihood. They should simply say that they take care of livestock. Now this is true, without playing in the prejudice of the Egyptian, and the Pharaoh knows full well what they actually do. Boy, does this raise a question. Doesn't it? How many have a question? (laughs) Is this sinful? Is this evidence that Joseph has been in Egypt too long? A bunch of my commentaries say so. Joseph has lost his sensitivity to lying in truth, and here is evidence of it. Well, is that true? Is he telling his family to lie? Is this what they is this in what they are to say? Is this sin? Now we have seen this already, and we're going to see it over and over again in the Old Testament. We owe the truth to believers. We owe truth wrapped in love, but this is a part of what Jesus will call later being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. There are times, particularly with unbelievers, when it is unwise to tell all the truth you know. But it's not a falsehood. They are, after all, caring for livestock. They just don't say what livestock it is. Now, for many of you, this is totally unsatisfying. You live in a black and white world where truth is absolute and lies are absolute. And the Bible, frankly, will not sustain such a view. Now, I am not giving you permission to lie. Is that clear? Everybody here in this room and out in virtual land understands, right? Frankly, you cannot live with grace and kindness and Christian charity with a view that I have to tell you all the truth I know. Because some of you wear ugly hairdos, some of you really need help with your clothing, and 
almost all of you look ridiculous in your face diapers. (laughs) Now that's the truth. I'm telling it to you in love. Is that working for you? You see what I'm saying? And I certainly could not have gone into some of the countries I have. I have not told the Chinese interrogators all I know. In fact, I've told them almost none of what I actually knew. I do not owe unbelievers and particularly the enemies of God's people the whole truth. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, sometimes to tell the whole truth is to side with evil. Think about that. Well, and further, Joseph is living in the Old Testament and before the law. Well, leaving that, now if you'll go with me and don't park your brain there and go, oh, I miss the rest of the message, okay? Can we move on? Everybody ready to move on? All right. And so verses 1 to 18 continue our story with the interaction with the pagan king. One of the great challenges facing the leadership of God's people is know how to interact with pagans in authority. You see that all through the Bible. It's an interesting study. Every time a leader of God's people is interacting with someone who is pagan but in authority, watch what they do. Jesus, the disciples, the apostles, many of the Old Testament characters... But you know, Joseph is second in command in Egypt, but he still has to engage the Pharaoh in seeking a place and protection for his own people. And in this unit, Moses highlights the wisdom of Joseph, who models how to engage pagan people as God's kind of man. Here the providence of God has brought the son of Israel to have first place in the pagan world as he supplies them bread and brings them to servitude under an earthly king. Joseph's admirable faithfulness and diligence brought him into positions of leadership wherever he has been, Potiphar's house, the prison, and now in the whole country. But we've not necessarily been told how. He was faithful, he was a steward, people tended to put things in his care. And now we're going to see how Joseph's leadership functioned. Now first, there was the procuring of the Pharaoh's favor. Verses 1 to 6, Joseph presents himself before the Pharaoh. Chapter 47, so Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. And they are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds as our fathers were. And they have said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land. There is no pasture for your servants, flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and brothers have come to you. This land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Well, Joseph carefully announces the arrival of his brothers and their fathers with all they have and they own. And as he asked earlier, he settles them in the land of Goshen. Joseph wants to ensure that this is not just a temporary situation. He is going to secure this part of Egypt as a permanent portion as long as they dwell there. Little could Joseph have known. It would be 400 years. And Joseph also chooses five of his brothers to bring before the Pharaoh. We are not told the reasons for choosing only five. We can guess. 
but it is a conscious act, both in how many he chooses and in the ones he chooses. This is a bit of putting your best foot forward. However, the idea here is not to appear in a way that encourages a mingling with the Egyptians, but rather highlights the desirability of separateness. There are two challenges here then. They are going to need space, and they're going to need identity. They must have space for the present flocks and future prosperity, but they must also be able to maintain their uniqueness as God's people. They must live in Egypt without becoming Egyptian. Now remember, this is written to them as they're coming out of Egypt. And the next book in the Mosaic 5 is all about helping Israel to remember they are not Egyptian. Over 400 years, they had mingled their identity. They must have space for the present flocks and future prosperity. They must be able to maintain their uniqueness. They must live in Egypt without becoming Egyptian. And they will want to pursue their vocation under God and continue to grow and multiply as God's people. Their challenge is like ours. We must live in here in this world. But we must not become a part of of the world. We must learn to live in and engage with the world without being poured into its mold. Israel prospered. Israel maintained her identity. But the wilderness wanderings are full of how much of Egypt had gotten into the Israelites. This is what all God's heart work in hard providences is all about. It is the uprooting of Egypt from our hearts so that we will love God and we will love neighbor. Well, so Pharaoh asks the obvious question of each of all their time and all over the world, what do you do for a living? This is the first, probably the second thing most men ask each other. What's your name? What do you do? Isn't it? So what do you do for a living? Now, remember, he probably already knows because Joseph has told them, but he's asking these five men, and based on their occupation as shepherds, which the Egyptians despised, they ask for a separate land where they are now pastured called Goshen. The Pharaoh offers them any land they want. And he is glad for them to take the land that they request. And recognizing their abilities, I love this. The Pharaoh even turns over his own flocks and herds to their care. Now, you know, when you, you read a story like this, and you say, oh, that's really cool. Well, not if you're an Egyptian herdsman. Think about that. Then there is the presenting of his father. Joseph brings in his father to present him to the Pharaoh. Verse 7, Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the years, to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt and the best of the land and the land of the Ramses as Pharaoh had commanded. Now, just, just a historical note. That's going to be important 400 years later. Where they are in Egypt would then be ruled out of the northern kingdom, not the southern kingdom. 
And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food according to the number of their dependents. And surely he has told the Pharaoh stories of his family and his father, given all that Pharaoh seems to know about God. Joseph has related his family history to God's promises and to God's provisions. So here is the grand patriarch of this great tribe. Here is the man to whom God had affirmed the covenant and through whom God would bring about the 12 tribes. He stands before this pagan ruler and he conveys a blessing upon the Pharaoh. This is not just high. (laughs) This is a God's man, the covenant head of the future Messiah and the father of a future nation. The Pharaoh may be the one upon the throne, But nevertheless, once again, the greater is blessing the lesser. Pharaoh asked him how old he is. I imagine this is triggered by how he looks. He's 130 years old. And further, Jacob responds with, by apparently complaining of his lot in life. Compared to his forefathers, his life has been relatively short. And all his days have been full of hardship and grief and evil. It's hard. It's hard to be kind to Jacob at this point. What in the world are you doing? Why would you do this? Here I believe he succumbs to one of the sins of old age. The troubles of the past are magnified. And the blessing of the present are minimized. Would every gray-haired person in this room say, Amen? That would be me. Troubles of the past tend to be magnified. And the blessings of the present minimized. Here is an opportunity to exalt God. To show in the midst of the harshness of life. The blessings of that God has done. But no, all he can say is only lived 130 years. I wonder what the Pharaoh's thinking. 130 years, you've got to be kidding, man. And it has been a really rough life. Now, how much of, jo- of Jacob's rough life was because of his own choosing, his own sin, and his own folly, Right? May God give us grace in the senior years of life to be seasoned with spiritual joy and hope even in the midst of physical decline and difficulty. And just a brief note. Jacob, giving his age here, also helps establish a timeline to Adam. Here is another milestone, among others, that marked the years from Noah's flood through Abraham's call to Israel's leaving at the Exodus, and it's exactly right. The closing of this day sees Joseph busily settling everyone in, providing their needs, and making all at home. His careful faithfulness and wisdom have secured a great place for his people and all with the favor and smile of the Pharaoh. And then there is provision for a pagan people. Now we have seen how Joseph brought his needs and requests to the pagan ruler. Now we see how he implemented a program for distributing stockpiles of food to the people. This is one of those things that as an expositor you come along and go, yeah but, okay, nice historical deal, but so what? What is, why does Moses write this? Now remember, It's coming to us indirectly. It doesn't come to us as though this were written directly to us. It's for us. And therefore we ought to learn from it. But but Israel, 400 years later, needed to understand why the land of Egypt was the way it was. Because it wasn't like this when they went down. A radical transformation in the economy of Egypt took place under Joseph. It had a massive effect on what happened when they left. 
So let's watch. That's the purpose of this text. And watch what happens here. First, he begins in the selling of their larder, their largesse, what he, they had gathered up over the years. And verses 13 to 18. The Egyptian people began to run of their own private stores. Verse 13, now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain they bought. What is he saying? All right? All the currency in the land is now in the hands of the Pharaoh. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Well, give me your livestock and we will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, the donkeys. And he supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock in the year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are all my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies." And our land. So all must come to Joseph to do what the foreigners coming had to do. They had to pay for the grain that he had stockpiled. First, over a year, they spend all their money. Joseph sells them the grain as the famine deepens. He gathers up the money coming in and, and adds it to the Pharaoh's wealth. He continues to sell the grain as long as the people have the money to buy it. We are probably in the fifth year of the famine. The effect over the duration of the famine is to move all the currency from the general circulation and put it all in the treasure houses of the king. Once the Egyptian people have begun to run out of money, they come to Joseph looking for grain. This is end up probably the end of the fifth into the sixth year. And he makes them an offer. They can trade their livestock for grain. So for over a year, the Egyptian people buy the grain they need by exchanging their livestock for it. So the ownership of all of the viable livestock in the land of Egypt comes under the brand, the ownership of the Pharaoh. The people are still caring for them. Joseph is accumulating vast wealth and resources for the Pharaoh. But the effect is to impoverish the people. Eventually, this will begin to serve to impoverish and to weaken the nation. So what do you do when you're out of money? What do you do when you're out of the livestock you have raised? What's next in the last year of the famine? In accordance with what would later be codified in God's law, Joseph sells the food to the Egyptian in exchange for their freedom and for their land. Verses 19 to 22. Verse 19, Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Seventh year, it's going to end. They need seed for the eighth year. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their fields, because the famine was severe on them. The land became the Pharaohs. Do you see it? What a transformation in Egypt over probably three to four years, from freedom, economic wealth, people having currency, having their own livestock, having their own land, and now they have to sell themselves to sustain themselves. 
And as for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priest he did not buy, because he's not a stupid man. For the priest had a fixed allowance for Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that the Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Now, for many, this is troubling, and it should be. It should be. Why, given in their increasing plight and dire hardship, does he simply not give it to them? Leviticus 25, 14 to 43 addresses parallel situations for Israel when they receive God's law. It was a great act of charity to buy the land of the destitute and to bring them on as servants so as to provide for them. What? What Joseph did here was codified in the Mosaic law as an act of charity and compassion. It boggles our minds. Modern welfare system of forcible taking from one group who has in order to freely give to those who don't have or won't work is unbiblical and immoral and will eventually erode the character of people. We have grown up, most of us, under a welfare system. We have so breathed its air that it's difficult to accept what the Bible clearly says. In both the Old and New Testaments, the people of God were to care for each other in personal and in corporate ways. In the Old Testament, every farmer was to leave the corners of the fields unharvested so that the poor could come and they could glean. But the poor had to come and they had to work for what they received. Never did the Jewish government nor the Levitical tax system force the taking of money or harvest from producers in the economy to simply dole out to those who were needy. If you were needy, there was a place to go to to supply for yourself. Yet the Bible commands people to love neighbor in such a way that we take care of one another. In Leviticus 25, a person was so destitute they had nothing they could offer themselves in their lands for sale. It was considered a great mercy when someone stepped up to accept the offer. But the term of the sale was limited. It could only last until the next sabbatical year by agreement to the next jubilee every 70 years. The person could be redeemed by a relative. They could redeem themselves if they inherited wealth. What appears to us to be taking advantage of their plight is, in God's view, an act of charity and compassion. Now, the New Testament radically changes this. Corporate benevolent care is for God's people. It is always voluntary. It may be covenantal or promised. Personal and individual charity to neighbors, whether they are believers or not, is also commanded. This reflects God's way in salvation. The benefits of salvation are freely given by the free will of God, who dispenses his mercy and his benevolence as he sees fit. There's no room for demand. On our part, we are supplicants who give up all to our king and when he gives by grace to us who are utterly depraved and destitute and desperate. So the providence of God in bringing the famine and in placing Joseph where he was is being worked out. Part of God's purpose in the famine was to bring the whole economy under the ownership and control of the Pharaoh. And further... Israel was not subject to this as they owned and grazed on their own lands. God had promised to preserve them, to prosper them. Now he does so in the most surprising places and in the most unusual ways. And now that the Egyptians had begun to sell their land to the Pharaoh, Joseph prepared a way for them to live on the land and to be able to pay the Pharaoh for the privilege. And so he makes a law. Verse 23, Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land, and at the harvest you shall give a fifth. What is that? How much tax is that? 20%, right? You can do the math. To Pharaoh. And four-fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, as food for yourselves, for your household, as food for your little ones. 
And they said, you have saved our lives. May it please the Lord. We will be servants to Pharaoh. Joseph made a statute concerning the land of Egypt. And it stands to this day. There's the key. On the day when Moses wrote this, Joseph's 400-year-old statute still stood. Still stood. That Pharaoh should have the fifth, and the land of the priests alone did not become the Pharaoh's. Well, we would recognize this system from history as European feudalism. The local baron or king owns the land. The people live on his lands and farm it. They pay him from what is produced as their rent. They keep the rest for themselves. In this way, the people can sustain themselves at present and in the future. We are not told if Joseph instituted some system of redeeming the land. History does not indicate that it was so. 400 years later, the land of Egypt was owned by the Pharaoh. And the people lived on it at his largesse. So with the affirmation of the people, Joseph made the statues permanent. Pharaoh owned all the land. People who lived on the land and farmed from the land paid a 20% rent to produce from the land. Moses is recording this for the sake of the Israelites. They had learned over the 400 years what a hard taskmaster a wicked king is when he has absolute control and absolute ownership. They had seen the importance of land to the functioning for a functioning economy. Having been reminded of all this, they should then welcome the framework and the freedom that God's law would afford them when it was given. Well, this has been a bit of a tough text. We got a lesson on lying and truth, which we probably struggle with, and we got a lesson on economics. You probably didn't think you'd come to Sunday morning church and hear such a thing. But it's important for us to think carefully and biblically when we make our statements about our responsibility to government, to the poor. And so on. Hopefully this morning you are spurred to take up your Bible and work through some of this yourself. Being ever mindful, we do not live in Egypt. We do not live under the old covenant. We are God's new covenant people. And finally, there is protection for God's people in verses 27 through 31. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it, and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. And so the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, I have now found favor in your sight. Put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. And Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Little did they know that they would keep that casket of bones for 400 years. Well, we see this in the posterity of his people. They have settled in the land they have settled in. They prosper for 17 years. They gain much wealth and become a great nation. These two verses are the thematic line for the new covenant. God had sent them down to Egypt. God had protected and prospered them there. They are away from the promised land, but there they are subject to God's very great care. And let this be our encouragement. We who are the people of God, we who are living away from heaven, our promised land, we are still under the care of God. He will provide for us. He will protect us. And it is time unto the great home going. Jesus has already made his exodus into heaven and one day we will make our exodus from this world. And then in the promise to his father, Jacob believes God's promises, though he's now living away from the promised land, he believes they will return. 
But he is coming to the end of his life. He does not want to die and have his remains left in Egypt. So he summons Joseph. He makes him promise to bring his body back with them when they return. And there is a great expression of his both. He both believes the promises of God and is submitted to the providences of God. I will one day go home, but I don't know when. And here is a simple and very hard lesson for us. We want to believe the promises of God. And we can take him at his word. But we so often crave different circumstances than God has placed us in. Now, if I were preaching in a black church, I would say, can I have an amen? And therefore, we must not only believe in him, but we must bow to him. We must do so in a way that leads forward in the future and commits it entirely to his wise and sovereign providences. Just some highlights. I'm a bit long this morning. What instruction is intended for us upon whom the ends of the ages are come? Seek the way of wisdom in the midst of God's providences. Your difficult circumstances now are an opportunity to display the glory and greatness of Christ, particularly as he gives you wisdom. Make him look large as you wind your way through opportunities and obstacles. Engage in unpagan or unbelieving, which by the way is the same thing, authorities with careful wisdom, forethought, and speech. God's people of all people should be people wise. Should not simply assert our rights or make our demands, particularly from the stance of being a Christian. Grow old with grace. I used to think about this as sometime in the long distant future. Not anymore. Be becoming a senior saint who is serious and joyous. Do not magnify your present troubles nor your past hardships except where and when you can magnify God. For he is sustaining, yes, even better, who is causing you to thrive through them. Be fierce in your adherence to God's word even when it counters the accepted wisdom of of the world. We must care for our needy while not violating God's word. We will find the third way between giving to our own in need and requiring appropriate work for study. And finally, let us keep faith with our families. We have miles to go and promises to keep. And when we honor our parents by caring for them and providing for them as we can, then God is pleased with us. Give them the honor and support you are commanded. And remember to be with your forever family as often as you can. Grace in the midst of Egypt. Glory to God and his unending providence. Loving one another as an overflow of love for God. As we live waiting the great exodus when we go home. Let's pray. Father. Give us the spiritual eyes to see and the heart to crave what through the lens of the cross and resurrection is a story in this very old and ancient day. Help us to live well, to live wisely, and to live in a way that is worthy of that calling that you have called us to in this present age, in this present world, in this culture, in our place and in these hard providences. And grant that we will be a shining light holding forth the word of the gospel from a people who love one another and put each other first. For the glory of Jesus.